Welcome to the Company of Dads Year in Review. The majority of our podcasts focus on lead dads and their stories, but we also sought out experts in all sorts of things that relate to men as fathers, husbands, earners, and people. There are academics who study pandemic parenting and academics who studied men at work. There are advocates for fathers and experts on the social forces that influence dads navigating the new normal. Listen to quick tips from a selection of them. Kristen Shockley, a professor at the University of Georgia, did some of the earliest research on the effect of the pandemic on parenting. And one of her key findings that some of the people who did the worst at their work while being remote were the people who did the least at parenting. In other words, the people who left it all upon one spouse to do the parenting, that did not enable them to perform more highly at work. This is just one of her many insights from some really early crucial research. Have a listen to how the findings came about. So we very quickly launched a study and um, we surveyed dual earner couples, so both people were working and had to keep working at this point, um, who had at least one child under age six. And we wanted to focus on people with young kids because they're just a little bit more demanding from the childcare perspective. And um, so we got the surveys out, like I said, I think it was like March 20th, um, asked them, what are your plans for dealing with childcare you know, in this upcoming time? How are you gonna have to adjust your uh, work schedule, how will your spouse? We asked, um, and they were all heterosexual couples. We asked the wife and the husband. Um, and then we content coded that to see sort of what people were saying. And then two months later, we'd originally planned to follow up after the pandemic was over. We all know that's kind of a joke, right? <laughs> we still still are in it. So we decided two months later, things, you know, people probably were in a bit of a routine. Um, and then we assessed some well being. So, in terms of like psychological distress, sleep, uh, family functioning in terms of relationship tension, um, family cohesion, and then job performance. Um, and going into it, we're really interested in, did people use gendered strategies? So was this falling mostly on women or are we seeing kind of more egalitarian um, type divisions of labor? Yep. And the, the part you're talking about, the shocking or depressing part was the biggest, so then we did some kind of complex analyses, sort of content coded that data and kind of came up with these groupings. And the biggest group we had, which was 22% of our data, was called the wife remote and doing it all. So these were couples where- And um, that's that's not something you want on a, on a coffee mug, I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> no, you, I don't think, well, I could tell you, it wasn't great in terms of outcomes for that group. Um, so this this these couples were, just like the name implies, the, the wife was remote, the husband sometimes was, sometimes wasn't but she was doing pretty much all of the childcare. Um, mm-hmm. And they, you saw, not surprisingly, those people had the highest relationship tension, reported the lowest family cohesion. Um, they were surprisingly, they didn't have the lowest sleep, um, had low psychological or highest psychological distress and also were not performing very well. So uh, it doesn't surprise me that they didn't have the lowest <laughs> sleep because they're probably exhausted. And then when yeah, just passed right out. And, just passed right um, out. and what I thought was interesting thinking about this from the dad's perspective, I would have thought if you were in that couple, then, um, and you were the husband, your job performance would have been fine because you, you know, you weren't really changing anything, but actually that was not the group that had the best job performance. And mm-hmm. I think that speaks to the issue of if one person is taking all this labor, it's creating this tension in the relationship and that's spilling over into the husband's work life too, even if he isn't actually doing the childcare. So if we take like a, a step back and think about it from an organizational standpoint, like it's not great to just not offer flexibility for people because you know it may ultimately result in them performing worse because you're having them, then they have to put it on someone else in their household. Jamie Ladge, a professor at Northeastern University and an expert on the trade-offs parents have to make, talked about her research on fathers at work and how company policies and expectations often kept those fathers from being involved parents and that hurt both men and women have a listen to how things might be changing we particularly were focused on fathers who wanted to be involved fathers um, who had that who had set that expectation for themselves and their wives as well and so we we wanted to know what what's it like to be an involved dad? What are the pressures and experiences that you have in reentry? Um, do they take the kind of breaks um, 
and, and parental leave that, that mothers take. I mean, they often don't because they're, they tend to be more stigmatized for, yeah. um, you know, what I would say, taking it too far. Right. Um, it's okay to take a couple of weeks off, but four months paternity leave. Whoa. Now you've, now you've, um, you know, defying expectations of, of what it means to be, you know, masculine and what it means to be a man. Um, but those were the things that we were really interested in. And so, I mean, parenting, I would say is hard work when fathers enter the conversation that actually only helps mothers. Um, it doesn't hurt them. It helps them because now everybody's part of that conversation. We used to just have affinity groups that were just for working mothers. And now it's about working parents. Um, and I know I've been very cognizant of um, opening up that that line of communication and just talking more about it. And I think it's become more commonplace for fathers to be able to talk about their role. Um, yeah. You know, that it's not so much a, it's just as much a badge of masculinity to be a good dad as it is, you know, to be a, a good worker as well. Kenneth Braswell is a leader in the Responsible Fatherhood Movement and the Chief Executive of Fathers Incorporated, a widely recognized nonprofit that supports fathers, researchers, and policymakers. I met Kenneth at an Equimundo conference in Los Angeles over the spring where he had a great discussion on the demands of being a father today. What's his number one tip for all fathers? He shares it here. One of the biggest things I've learned is patience. Um, not trying to parent too fast, not trying to force my children um, to be independent too fast, um, not to take myself too seriously too quickly, right? And having patience, even with my business of doing fatherhood, having patience in the understanding, Paul, that I can't do it all. Um, however, at the same time, there is a great need out there um, and it is a growing need. And they, there are not enough fingers um, to put um, in all of the holes in the dike um, that are bleeding with the pain of children not having fathers in their lives, of fathers struggling to be in their children's lives, of families dealing with some levels of father absence, even um, with the parents or in their own individual situations. And so I've had to temper my, uh, my need to want to save the world um, and to be able to position myself to speak to the voices that hear me, right? And work with those fathers and support and love on um, others such as yourself, um, for being a soldier in this field with me so that I don't have to feel like I have to do it all, that I have peers of other men out there who share my passion about fathers in particular that are doing their um, thing in their space based on their calling um, to help in this effort. Dana Suskin, a renowned pediatric surgeon in Chicago, wrote an insightful book this year, Parent Nation, it laid out research and a roadmap to change how early child care is handled in America. We talked about parental leave and what else is needed to help parents, but we also talked about how doing this will allow companies to move the bottom line. I was at this event recently, and one of the panelists is a woman who's a PhD economist working, uh, running a think tank, and she flat out she said, you know, if I could find uh, a company or an employer or a nonprofit that had high quality childcare on site, I would never leave that job. And here she is, you know, you know, representing, I'm not gonna say who she is, but representing her employer out there and saying, you know, essentially by saying they're not really doing, you know, their role. And it's, it's, it's issues like that I'd love for you to delve into a bit because, you know, earlier this year, we had a lot of conversations about uh, paid parental leave. Uh, I, I'm all for it. Uh, I'm all for it to, to, to get men to take more leave. I'm all for it to, you know, have lower income people to have a chance to, to bond more with their children. But, you know, if COVID taught us anything, it's that, you know, <laughs> parenting challenges don't stop after the first, you know, six months. Um, you know, children aren't less, you know, time consuming. They have different needs as they, as they get older. What, you know, what can companies do if not, you know, a big, yeah. you know, national, what can companies do to sort of recognize this need and recognize that caregiving is essential, not just for families, but for the functioning uh, of our economy? 
Yeah, no, I actually, I love this question because I actually think I, I'm quite bullish. That's a term, I guess, from your your world uh, on the role of business because- Well, you, you are married to an economist, so you, you yeah. can use that term, you know. <laughs> bullish that 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 they can play you know you know they're the economic engines of our of our country and i always say if they can bring their innovation and economic might to this issue you know showing that what's good for parents and caregivers is good for the bottom line i think it'll really help move the rest of society fail forward and especially in this moment in time with such low unemployment and people employees really you know talking with their feet, right? So many, you know, I can't remember the stat, but a number of, you know, a huge portion of millennials said, just as that female economist said that, look, if another company had better family-friendly policies, they would, you know, switch jobs. And, you know, if, you know, if employers start sort of acting in, in that way, both, at, you know, instituting more family friendly policies which you know we can talk about all of them but i think the the basic sort of buckets are you know flexibility reliability you know a living wage you know child you know help with child care that um it'll start sort of pushing the rest of society along um the truth is is that employers are hurting parents are hurting the most right, with the lack of infrastructure, but employees are hurting too. Employers are hurting as well. So I think they can play a large role in shifting what's going on in this country. So Jay Loff is at the forefront of chronicling the workplace of the future as a co-founder and president of Charter. He's had a great career in magazines and media, but for 20 years, the constant was his daily commute. He was a veteran of Metro North, the train that took him from Fairfield, Connecticut to New York City. It was two plus hours commute just one way. It got so bad that he preferred flying far away to sitting on that train to go into his New York City office. COVID changed all that. At home with his wife and two daughters, he found the joys of being a lead dad, getting time back after years of commuting. It changed his view on work and parenting, and he's never going back to that daily commute. But more broadly, he's using that experience to influence the conversation on what work will look like going forward. Listen to his thoughts on being honest as a parent and a worker. In my dreams, you know, if you have really good workers, I would love somebody to say, you know what, I need to take the next hour uh, and just go take a walk with my daughter. Uh, she had a hard yeah. day at school. Uh, I'm just gonna take a walk uh, and maybe get her some ice cream, but uh, I'll log back on an hour, hour and a half. And, you know, don't worry, I don't have anything planned tonight. I'll, I'll finish everything up at 10. Do you think we're, we're at that moment where, you know, the worker parent can be that level of honest, or should we just be happy that we can say, Hey, I got to go to a baseball game and you get a free pass for that. Yeah, no, I hope so. I think, I think we're getting closer and closer to that. And I think the reason is that if you look at the data around, you know, there's a lot of talk about the great resignation. The numbers are true. I think it's something like, you know, 4 million people have a month for, you know, the last since February or something have, um, you know, have left their jobs. And the number of people who are considering leaving their jobs remains incredibly historically very high. And if you look at the number one and two reasons, which are neck and neck for doing that, one is pay, no, no surprise, but the other is flexibility. Um, with flexibility often leading, people want flexibility for the very reason that you're saying. And part of that flexibility is the ability to work from anywhere, or at least that's the other point, I guess, Paul, about you know going back to the office. People are not actually, a lot of people are not resistant to going back to the office uh, per se. It's going back to the office, you know, nine to five or nine to six or whatever the hours are. It's without having the flexibility to do exactly what you were just talking about. Now with a commute like mine, you know, sure, the walk is going to be delayed by two hours. I mean, I can regale you with stories of, you know, having to rush to, to take care of my dad who was, you know, in his nineties and ended up in the emergency room and take me three and a half hours to actually get to the emergency room from the minute I got the call. Um, but I think having that flexibility is becoming a more important thing. If, if, if not, because it is the right thing to do, it's the necessary thing to do because you're going to lose people. People are going to leave and they're going to go to greener pastures that allow that flexibility. And so the competition for quality talent who, you know, when their number one expectation is that flexibility, I think is going to remain acute and, and probably change what the dynamic is here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, I think it's a great thing, you know, to, to, to tell another story from my own life. 
in, in with charter, the current thing that we're doing, and as you said, the teams are all remote, we're all on Slack all day, and you know what people are doing on Slack, you're, you're in a meeting, you're, you're available, whatever it is, I very intentionally, because I could not do this for 20 years, uh, I have dinner with my wife, who luckily still likes me, um, the, the loving was a was a given, because we've been together a long time, but it turns out we still like each other. Um, I have dinner with her every night from about six to seven fifteen. We like to eat early, and I could never do that before. And I put on Slack like dinner with Dawn, and it's and it means don't try to ping me between six and seven thirty because I'll be doing dinner and doing the dishes and playing some music and engaging with my wife. And then yeah, sure, I go back to the office a lot of nights because there's a lot to do in a startup. Right. But I I'm I'm really clear about what that hour and a half is and the fact that I'm going to take it. I don't care what everybody else is doing at that point. But unlike you know with you and you're a publisher of various magazines and, and you would go to the, the library, which you, you didn't go to uh, here, you're, you're really setting the right tone because you're being very open about it. Like, Oh, okay. Right. If Jay has taken this, you know, hour and a half uh, to have dinner and, and to talk, but I mean, you're not eating for an hour. You're talking with your wife, you're spending time right. with her, you're discussing your days or you're talking about your children or what, where you want to, all kinds of things that are That's essential right. to being a human. Um, I think, uh, you know, in you putting it down like that, I think what you're really doing is giving your employees, you know, license to do the same. I'm like, oh, okay. Precisely. Well, Jay can do it. I can do it. He's not going to yell at me. He did it. You know, this is how we're wired. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, I think that's exactly right. I, I think what we do really well that the companies need to adopt as well is like have clear stretches of the day that are designed for meetings. Um, so that you've got chunks of hours where, that, where people can be flexible. Jeff Forte is a leading special education attorney. When it comes to a child's educational needs, he has one piece of advice for fathers, whether they're lead dads or not. Listen to it here. I actually did a little bit of research in advance of the show, and there's a, um, there's a survey that was commissioned in the late 1990s and then again in the early 2000s by the National Center for Fathering. And essentially what it showed was that dads really statistically don't get that deeply involved in their child's um, education and schooling. Uh, most dads- why, why is that? Why, why they, they just, is this yeah, historically um, or why aren't they that involved? Uh, Work-wise, um, they, they think school is where the school team handles their child's education and they just, they don't necessarily get that involved. Um, it, it's more like the dad role is typically where right. they're going to sporting events to help their kid. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not, you know, um, they're not uh, visiting their child's classroom. Mm -hmm. They may not even know what their child's teacher's name is or let alone their, their, their child's pediatrician's name is. Yeah. Um, you know, helping with homework or a, or a big school project, you typically will see, you know, um, you know, dads go to, you know, plays and recitals and sports, sure. but the, the, the parent teacher conference, reviewing report cards, um, helping with homework, going on to, you know, Google classroom every week to make sure assignments may be in. Mm -hmm. These are things that even just without qualifying for special education, the more parents, moms too, of course, are involved, the more informed you're going to be about your child within the educational community. Um, and I think it's something that gets lost a lot is, you know, what is an educational community? Um, and it involves parents. I mean, it's not just the school team. Parents should realize that they are part of their child's school team. Too often, men resist being lead dads, or at least being honest about their role, because of the link between money and masculinity. Dr. Brad Klontz, a financial psychologist, talks about the detrimental link between the two, and how breaking that link will allow men to fulfill their full potential, while also allowing women to soar at work. I think a lot of it has to do with how oriented we are to the traditional roles that have been around for you know, decades and centuries and generations. I think your attachment to that in terms of your self-esteem, I think that's probably the biggest predictor in terms of your, how comfortable you are taking um, you know, a primary breadwinner status or a, a shared one or being the one who's not bringing in 
as much money into the relationship. So I think a lot of it has to do with your attachment to that traditional role versus your flexibility around how you perceive yourself and your value in your relationship and with your kids and your family. Are some people just going to be wired to be more uh, open to being a, a, a lead dad, or is there a way we can do some sort of you know lead dad boot camp and bring some of those other guys up to speed? Yeah, I think probably some of it is is just how flexible are you in your thinking, how um, willing are you to go against the grain? Because again, there's not a lot of role models, and so a lot of this has to be constructed on our own or or with another group of dads. So I think it's flexibility and thinking, open mindedness is probably a huge component of it, because there, there's no doubt that um, studies we've done related to this have been mostly around women who are um, earning more than their male husbands and partners. And some of the pressure they get and stress they get from family and friends and people around them that, uh, you know, you're stepping out of the traditional role and he's stepping out of the traditional role. And so you have to be willing to surround yourself with people who are more open minded or living, you know, more of a uh, um, egalitarian approach to parenting, if you will, or you're going to be succumbing to some of that pressure. And a lot of that gets internalized and you start to wonder, am I doing the right thing? Am I living up to the standards that I'm supposed to be living up to? Thanks to all of our experts this year, and thanks to you for listening. We're off to a great start, and I'm eager to see what 2023 will bring.